Could the Linux and open source news be any cooler? Sorry, only 30 year olds or more will get this reference and then they will be sad. Anyway, this week we have the Linux Mint team working on Wayland. Finally, although it's gonna take a long while before you can use it as a daily driver. We have YouTube's adblock blocker being challenged by a privacy advocate, at least in the EU. And we have Fedora 39 being delayed twice. And we also have a lot more stuff, including a new accessibility framework that maybe will finally fix accessibility on Linux. And I'm fixing the lack of sponsor in this video, thanks to this message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Proton. They are your privacy-focused online suite, complete with an email address, an online storage space, a VPN, a calendar, and a password manager. All of it is protected with end-to-end -end and zero-access encryption, so not even Proton can access what you store or write there. And they have a ton of security and privacy focused features baked in with the ability to quickly unsubscribe from newsletters, email tracker blocking so companies can't see if and when you open their email or support for two-factor authentication and hardware security keys among many other. Proton is open source so anyone can audit the code. They have mobile apps for Android and iOS, and you can still use your email client of choice with Proton Bridge while keeping all the benefits from the strong encryption. You can create a free account, but if you need more storage space, email aliases, high-speed VPN connections, or custom email domains, they have paid plans to do all of that and a lot more as well. So click the link in the description to start using Proton Mail and regain your privacy. So, do you like Linux Mint and Cinnamon, but you wished they would work on Wayland support? Well, there are good news this week. They're doing exactly that. A first experimental session will be provided with Mint 21.3, but X11 will still be the default. And it's also planned to keep it as the default for Mint 22. Cinnamon 6 will be the first release of the desktop to have those first experimental bricks of Wayland support. And it should release before the end of the year with Mint 21.3. So other distros will also be able to offer access to that session as well. The Mint team has a Trello board with the list of issues they need to tackle if you're interested in looking at them or better in fixing them. They're basically giving themselves two years to fix all issues and they expect Wayland support to be fully ready for Mint 23, so in 2026. That's far away, but at least they're working on it. In other Mint news, they now have an unstable Mint version for people who want to test various releases before their official launch. This release is codenamed Romeo and you can enable it in the software sources of Mint. Of course, it will not be stable and it shouldn't be used in production, but if you have a spare computer to live on the edge, you can. And why Romeo? Well, Linux Mint usually has names associated with women and as they put it, there's always a Romeo ready to break their heart. In this case, pretty literally. It looks like YouTube's adblock blocker isn't going unchallenged, as a privacy advocate has now filed a complaint with the Irish Data Protection Commission, which oversees mostly all big tech companies in the EU, as they're all based in Ireland thanks to pretty big tax cuts. The complaint's basis is that Google doesn't ask for the user's consent for checking with their browser if they're actually blocking ads or not. The question then is whether a website should get consent before interrogating the browser on its capabilities or extensions. And it looks like the European Commission answered positively and said that yes, the website should get consent. The Irish Data Protection Commission also seems to not disagree and they reached out to YouTube. YouTube actually added to their terms of service that using an ad blocker violates said terms of service, but it looks like this might not be considered a valid clause as EU citizens have a right to use their equipment as they like and these checks would violate that. We'll have to see where it goes and if this mechanism to block ad block is actually legal, at least in the EU. I'm pretty sure that even if the European Commission rules that you should not and cannot legally do that, YouTube will keep doing it everywhere else in the world and they probably will find another less invasive way to do the exact same thing even in the EU. 
Now, if you were eagerly awaiting the release of Fedora 39 to benefit from a newer kernel, newer internals, GNOME 45, and more, then you will have to be a bit more patient. The release was initially planned for this week on the 24th, but it's now been pushed, as is often the case with Fedora. It should now be released early next week on the 31st of... Wait, no, it's been pushed another week and it's now planned for November 7th. The Fedora team discovered some last-minute bugs that they wanted to fix before pushing the new version out, with four active blockers remaining. The first one is a motor problem that breaks the net install, there's a problem with EFI that prevents the distro from booting on certain hardware, and there are two Raspberry Pi 4 related problems that make it impossible to install Fedora on this hardware. It's not a long wait, and Fedora usually pushes their release date after their first go or no go meeting, so it's not unusual to see. And if you're waiting for Fedora 39, I'll have a treat for you next week. I should receive the official Fedora Slimbook laptop, so I'll be looking at what's new in Fedora 39, but also at the laptop itself, which will support the Fedora project and the GNOME project when you buy it. Now it looks like OpenSUSE is getting rid of the green chameleon that served as its logo for a while now. The distro and its community announced a contest to design a fresh new logo for the whole community, but also for the various distros it includes. So Tumbleweed, the rolling release, Leap, the fixed release, and Slow Roll, the rolling release but more stable. The reasons behind this change is that first, OpenSUSE apparently experienced a surge in user numbers in recent years and an expansion in terms of the number of variants of the distro that they offer. They want to unify their brand and products within a new visual brand. And second, they want to differentiate themselves from SUSE Linux's old logo to really mark the difference between the commercial offering and the open source one. And finally, the current logo is hard to use at small sizes because it's mixing an image and some text. So if you're an artist and you have ideas, you can help and offer a concept for a logo for the whole project and all its various products. There are a few specifications, like using the SUSE green color as the primary color, not using third-party material, and a few other common sense related things. I was never a fan of the current look of that green chameleon. It's sort of cute, but it's also sort of derpy. I think they should keep that reptile theme, but maybe stylize it a bit more to make it a bit more modern and a bit more less derpy. Now, for our desktop-related news. First, we have a big update on KDE and Plasma 6. The developers have now implemented color profiles on a per-screen basis, which means you can have a different ICC color profile for each of your display. This only works with Wayland, of course, and will be exported to X Wayland in the future, but probably will not support X11. They've also added the good old desktop cube effect back in the KDE Plasma add-ons package. The screenshot tool can now also take screenshots without shadows under the windows. Discover got a bunch of improvements with better visual alignment and fixes to how information is displayed for flatback apps. The app details page also got a better screenshot viewer. There were also some styling fixes to make all settings dialogues look the same, plus a lot of bug fixes, 220 across the past two weeks. As per GNOME, there's now a new website to present desktop portals to developers. Workbench now supports Python to let you experiment with GNOME technologies in the language of your choice, and there's a new release of Celeste, a file sync program that can connect to Nextcloud, Google Drive, Dropbox, pCloud, and now also Proton Drive. The GNOME Foundation also planned a meet and greet with their new executive director, so you can submit your questions until November the 7th. Hopefully this will alleviate some concerns that people had regarding this nomination, and maybe we'll learn more about Holly Million, the new executive director. Still, pretty nice to see that Plasma 6 is still implementing some really cool features and progressing along very nicely. Now, while the Linux desktop is getting its ducks in a row bit by bit to move to a new stack, including Flatpak and Wayland, there's one duck that sat abandoned, and that's accessibility. While adding accessibility features in X11 was relatively easy, since it doesn't really have a good security model, it's just easy to inject code in various processes, Wayland and sandboxed apps make it a lot harder, and so a new accessibility framework is being worked on. 
The basic design is taking a page from the book of web browsers like Chromium with a push-based architecture where the app pushes its accessibility tree to the accessibility API that can then use this information to enable things like screen readers and other accessibility-focused features. It won't completely revamp the fundamentals, everything is still based on a tree of information that the accessibility API uses, so developers can expect their current work on the subject to still be relevant. So over the next year, they will be experimenting with a prototype for this new architecture, and hopefully it will solve all the little accessibility problems that we've had on the Linux desktop for a long, long while, but are kind of being reinforced by the new sandboxed apps, Metaphor and Wayland. Now for a roundup of performance improvements. We're going to start with some GNOME stuff. Zero copy support for dedicated GPUs is being worked on for Mutter, the GNOME compositor, meaning that you will be able to pass through what the dedicated GPU renders to the integrated GPU that's used to power a display without latency, or at least with much reduced latency. In an example given by the developer, latency went from 6.9 milliseconds to 0.8 milliseconds. For now, patches are only working for the Nouveau drivers and the method used might not work for AMD or Intel dedicated GPUs as they don't work in the same way. But it's still pretty nice. It basically means you'll get a lot more performance when using hybrid graphics on GNOME with an NVIDIA device with the Nouveau drivers. Hopefully, it will also at some point support the proprietary NVIDIA drivers, but for now, it hasn't really been announced. And we also have the Mesa Drivers version 23.3 around the corner with a lot of Vulkan improvements for AMD, Raspberry Pi 5 support, and a lot of work in the Intel Arc drivers. It also brings Rust ICL for OpenCL support, Zinc for bringing OpenGL support to devices that only have Vulkan drivers, and the Azahi graphics drivers have also been much improved. All of this should release before the end of November, so we can expect some really nice performance improvements, at least for those of us who use GPUs with open source drivers. This should give a nice solid boost to my SteamOS console and to my Steam Deck, so I'll keep an eye on the release of these drivers. And not a performance improvement specifically, but the latest framework laptop using an AMD CPU now works with Linux, thanks to a BIOS update. There was a BIOS regression for the CPU they used, the Ryzen 7 7840U, which created problems with the integrated GPU. Flashing the new BIOS using firmware update should fix the problem and make these laptops work nicely with any Linux distro. And the flashing process is made really easy by the fact that Framework supports the Linux firmware vendor service, which means that one command line gets you all up to date, you reboot and you're done. And let's finish this with the gaming news. First, we have the stable release of Steam VR 2.0. It brings the latest Steam client and features with a revamped keyboard, Steam chat and Steam voice chat baked in and a much better store experience, plus easier access to your notifications. The interface looks like it took some cues from the Steam Deck with the same sort of theme and look to the interface and there are a bunch of other changes, including some Linux specific ones to use the latest Steam Linux runtime. There were also updates to the Steam Desktop Client and SteamOS, but the release notes are very, very long. They fixed a ton of bugs for remote play, for Steam input and more, and a few Linux specific fixes also made their way in, notably improving screen reader support and fixing the in-game overlay keyboard input in GNOME. That looks very good, and if the rumors are true, we might actually see a new VR-related device from Valve, probably running SteamOS and SteamVR 2, and I would be very interested in testing that. And if you tend to emulate games, notably the 3DS, you might be familiar with the Citra emulator. And after their recent move to using Vulkan, there's now a nice big boost to performance on Linux and the Steam Deck. Their latest development release seems to give a 20 to 30% performance improvement on Linux, which is sure to please a lot of people. Not me though, because Nintendo games for me are... Yeah, no, not my thing. What is my thing though, is the devices from our sponsor, Tuxedo. If you're a Linux user and you need to replace your computer with something else, you should probably start looking at devices that support Linux out of the box from our sponsor, Tuxedo. They make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux 
pre-installed and all the hardware has been picked specifically because it runs really well with Linux. And if they encountered any issues or problems, they submit patches upstream to fix those issues so everyone can benefit, not just them. They have a big range of devices that should cover every need and every price point from laptops to NUCs to towers, all price points, all performance levels. Every device has a lot of customization options for the hardware itself, but also for laptops, you can have your own custom keyboard layout, your own logo on the lid of your laptop, and all the laptops can be opened, repaired, and upgraded, including the RAM, the SSD, the battery, and sometimes even the wireless card. So if you need a new computer and you plan to run Linux on it and you want to support Linux's development, click the link in the description below and buy yourself a device from Tuxedo. They're really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, you know what to do. There's that like button, subscribe button, notification bell, comment section. And if you disliked it, you also know what to do. And if you want to support the channel, there are plenty of links to do just that in the description of the video. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.